this is a topic uh, about which I knew nothing about eight months ago. And when we started getting excited about the total eclipse that was coming to our region, I, I pondered this question. Well, I, I work with nature and natural systems. I also work with local communities, indigenous communities. And I wondered, well, how do wildlife and plants respond to a total eclipse? So I just started doing a little digging into this topic. Um, some of you in this room may know more than me. So feel free to contribute additional information that's just based on my review of published studies and all of the information that I am presenting tonight came from scientific studies that were published. A um, little bit about me. I'm a native Texan, born and raised in Kerrville, which makes me a Kerbert. Uh, I developed a passion for protecting nature early in, in my life, and so all of my um, undergraduate and graduate studies were in ecology, anthropology, um, botany, and I have a PhD in tropical ecology and human ecology. And I have both of those um, areas because when I was getting ready to go to graduate school, I was already heavily involved in conservation, advocacy, and I realized that you can't protect nature without working with people, especially, and I was interested in the tropics, especially in the tropics, where a lot of wildlands are still occupied by people, whether they're local people, local ranchers, or indigenous groups. And so I convinced um, my graduate advisors to let me combine those two fields. <laughs> Most of my career has been done, uh, worked at, done in the tropics, doing conservation science work, studying nature, working with indigenous communities, government agencies, working to establish large protected areas. But for the last eight years, I've been the executive director of St. Edwards University's Wild Basin Creative Research Center. I wanted something a little closer to home. The beauty of Wild Basin is that it is co-owned and co-managed by the university and Travis County, which is something that is common overseas. Protected areas are often co-managed because government agencies, especially in the tropics, don't have the resources or aren't physically at the location. So they work with local communities and other organizations. So I was interested in this co-managed preserve that was dedicated to preserving nature. And it's also part of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, which is over 30,000 acres of protected lands. So it's a really special place. And I'm an eclipse virgin, like some of you may be. Yes? It would be a good thing not to be a lion or Aztec and make that claim. What is that? An eclipse virgin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Historically, that's a lot. I think my sacrifice me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, I know we probably all read about what is a, a solar eclipse, but it's important in reference to this subject tonight in that we need to understand how it's different from an annular eclipse. The sun in a total solar eclipse, the moon passes directly in front of the sun, casting this very intense shadow on, on the earth, and that shadow moves along the <coughs> end um, across the earth. And so that section of our planet is plunged into darkness for a moment or several moments of time. And during that time of total darkness, the environment experiences some important changes, especially important for wildlife and plants, but also human. You'll be able to detect those changes if you're outside. The temperature goes down. Of course, illumination is reduced, but humidity goes up. This is the band across the, this great North American eclipse is, is taking across North America. I was curious, I was interested to find out that it's 123 miles wide out on average, which to me, I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty big. Um, this is the path of totality. It'll start in Mexico on the Pacific coast at about 11 a.m. their time, Pacific time. And in Blanco, 
the solar, the total eclipse <coughs> will begin at a 1.33 p.m. That's when it will begin to be completely dark. The zenith of our complete darkness is at 1.35. Um, we get three minutes and 45 seconds, which is pretty great, because if you look at other parts of the country, especially around us, San Antonio gets two minutes and three seconds. Austin gets one minute, just under two minutes. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it's a good place to be. It's not as good as Corona. Take it. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to take what we get. So these environmental changes that I mentioned are significant. So light values decrease up to 99%, depending on where you are on, in the path and, um, and what's going on around that, that day. And then the temperature decrease can be, you will perceive it. It can be up to 10 degrees. It takes a few minutes for that to happen, and then those temperature uh, temperatures will stay low even after the sun comes back out. And in particular, humidity will stay high for a little while after the sun comes out. But this is um, temperature and time. So you can see how it begins to drop before the totality and stays down for quite a while after, after totality. So the sun, uh, and I hadn't thought about it this way, but this is really our primary driver of energy for nature. It's really, really a critical abiotic mechanism that's driving all the biological functions or the, one of the most important abiotic drivers of, of the natural world. And it, it structured the biological world through giving cues for regulating circadian rhythms and annual rhythms such as um, sleeping, hibernation, migration, reproduction, foraging, all of these are cued by the sun. And you'll see some of that coming out in the study. So here's a few helpful websites that I've been monitoring. NASA has a great website if you're looking for um, up-to-date information or just curious. Uh, there's a great interactive website at the New York Times that I've been monitoring a few times a day. It's showing us the eclipse cloud, cloud cover forecast, and it's, like I said, it's holding steady at 80 to 100% cover with 58% chance of rain. And then there's the Great American Eclipse website, which is also really cool. So how do wildlife respond to a solar eclipse? When, we, when I first thought of this, I'm like, well, do they respond <coughs> strangely? Do they go into their dens? Do they swarm? Do they stop? Do they freeze? Um, do they start carrying out nocturnal patterns or change their calling activity or songs? Are there species that show no change? The challenges of studying wildlife response to solar eclipse is um, that it's so rare and it's so brief that you, it's hard to follow one of the basic rules of science, which is replication. When you do a scientific study, for it to be sound, you want to replicate your study multiple times or in multiple, almost identical locations under multiple, um, under the same conditions. And that's just not possible with an eclipse. Also, large or rare wildlife are hard to study in a short period of time, especially if it's only your one short period of time. Nonetheless, I was surprised to find quite a few published studies that have done a really good job, and I'm sure there will be more on Monday, um, using time-lapse cameras, acoustic recorders, <coughs> they use direct observation scan sampling of different populations or different individuals in wildlife. Drift nets are, um, you see a picture here, it's a net that you can submerge in an aquatic um, uh, system, like a stream or a creek or a river to sample the activity and, and abundance of aquatic invertebrates. At least in this case, they were looking at aquatic invertebrates. But curiously, they also use data from social media. I'm not a big fan, I don't, I mean, I peek every now and then, but um, social media can be a powerful tool if people register what they observe. And apparently people have done that with past eclipses, and so scientists have culled that data to um, compare it to normal day-to-day -day, um, activities of wildlife. And then some experience, 
experiments have also been set up where they set up an experiment before the eclipse and then monitored an organism's response in that area with that setting. So let's get to some responses. And I just want to say, if you fear you'll forget your question before I finish, feel free to stop and, and ask me at any time. So in terms of the most interesting uh, publications regarding bird responses, there was one uh, of an eclipse in 2020 in Ethiopia where they monitored numerous bird species. And basically, before the, and I want to say all of these studies did a good job of starting their study at least the day before and then monitoring the morning of. So they have that control period when the sun is normal and during the to total eclipse and typically for a period after. So they're really well done studies. Um, birds were carrying out their normal activity of moving, foraging, and courtship. They were not roosting or nesting but on the day before and the morning preceding the eclipse. But during the eclipse, Roosting behavior rose significantly, and other behaviors dropped significantly. During the total eclipse, all behaviors stopped. But another interesting thing is that the difference between a bird call and a bird song is that a call is typically sounding an alarm or calling for a particular <coughs> action of that organism. A song is just kind of communicating, looking for a mate, talking, you know, just basically uh, interspecies communication. During eclipses, call activity increased significantly. So essentially it was a sign of an alarm or a sign to let's do this. And this was true not only of birds, but also other animals like primates. In 1998, in an eclipse in Venezuela, some interesting observations also of birds, brown pelicans and frigate birds that fly over the, the coastal areas, as well as royal terns, were observed by this researcher. The pelicans and frigate birds, as soon as it, it started to get dark, they moved inland and started to roost. So the pelicans roost on cliffs next to the coast, and the frigate birds go into the forest, and they stayed there until the sun came back out. Curiously, the royal terns did not go anywhere, but they stopped foraging, they stopped diving into the sea for food, and they got into a tight block and flew back and forth really quickly over the sea. Probably just confused, or who knows. And it should also be noted that um, an eclipse is probably a once-in-a-lifetime event for even wildlife. So it's not something that they experience um, often. These are a great um, organism to study in an eclipse. Um, you can set up these acoustic recorders or do you know, just be in the field and monitor um, the bee activities. In India in 2019, they monitored bee activity and foraging, so going to flowers on the day before and on the day of eclipse. And the day before, before the eclipse, plants were visited by 19 species of bees. And I want to put in a plug here for Texas native bees. I, we just gave a talk at Wild Basin uh, last week. Our research director is a pollination expert. I had no idea we have so many bee species. You won't recognize them as bees, but they're little bees, like emerald bees and turquoise bees and Sure, we know our names. Anyway, so 19 species of bees visited these plants normally on the day before and the morning of, but during totality, only three species of bees visited plants, and only from one population, which that doesn't make sense if there are three species in one population. But my thought was, well, maybe these, this uh, population didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> In uh, North, the Great American North, America, North American Eclipse in 2017, this is a great study. Citizen science is where citizens, you and me, school children, everybody can contribute to a scientific study, either on their phones, by recording observations, going online and identifying constellations, 
And in 2017, researchers engaged uh, several dozen elementary schools in the Northwest, gave them acoustic recorders, and the students installed them in flowering areas. So prairies with flowers, gardens with flowers, etc. And those acoustic recorders recorded buzzing. So buzzing is an indicator of flying, but it's also just an indicator of bee activity. And during the totality, uh, the buzzing stopped. And it wasn't just a gradual, like at sunset, where you, it starts to go down. It was, they said it was like a cliff. It just stopped as soon as the sun was totally blocked. But interestingly, the buzzing had no change in the periods of dim light. Um, so bees and other insects, amphibians, they use the sun for orientation. And so as soon as, and maybe they can keep doing that in dim light, but as soon as the sun was gone, it just stopped. <laughs> Total eclipse of the zoo. This would be a great place to, um, institution to, to study the eclipse. And there was a study in Columbia, South Carolina in 2017. 13 of the 17 animals that they observed, and they had people at every, you know, all of the different um, exhibits, exhibited unusual behaviors. The majority um, exhibited what might be considered nighttime or evening, end of day behavior, but a, a number of them actually exhibited anxiety. And so I've got some, some of those species listed here. Um, baboons, gorillas, giraffes, flamingos, lorikeets. So evening behavior is you know, going in to rest or sleep or they groom, animals often groom each other in the evening, gathering together. Anxiety would be calls or you know, banging on the cage or, or pacing back and forth. So that was also fairly common. So five out of eight mammals, five out of six birds, and two out of two reptiles showed one of these unusual behaviors or multiple in the zoo. I found this study of orangutans really interesting. These orangutans are in a, a, what's it called, a rehabilitation center in Indonesia. And they observed these males during, uh, these um, orangutan during the eclipse. Flanged males versus unflanged, and I'll tell you what that means. So flanged males is a male who has reached sexual, uh, sexual reproductive age. Unflanged, so you see these flanges on the side of his face. That's he's sexually um, a, of a sexual reproductive age. Unflanged, they can be the same age. You have two males the same age, adult males, um, but one is flanged and one is unflanged. The flanged males sounded alarm calls, banged on the cage. The unflanged males simply went into their Type behaviors where they just decreased all activities and kind of rested. Which shows that the eclipses can be create environmental stressors for orangutans and other species. This was a great study. Uh, one of my favorite because they put research in three different nature reserves and they did use multiple methods to study multiple species. So they had three nature reserves in Indonesia. They used scan sampling, which is directly observing a particular species or a particular population, camera traps, acoustic recorders, and experimental studies. The black flying fox, which is one of the largest, the black flying fox is a bat. It's one of the largest uh, bats. It's about got about a wingspan of just over a meter. It's not the largest, but it's, it's large. They went to roost during the eclipse, which is highly unusual. Um, they never roost during the day. They got very quiet and they covered their bodies with their wings, basically protecting themselves and taking nighttime activity. Macaques ceased all activities, but three of the males sounded alarm calls. And that alarm call was 
compelling the others to gather around the alpha male. And this study, the researchers indicated that it didn't seem as much a nighttime activity as an anxiety activity. That they didn't know what was going on, so we get together and protect ourselves, protect our group. Amphibian species uh, sounded evening and nighttime calls during the eclipse. And then dung beetles, this was an experiment that they set up. They, a dung beetle rolls a, a ball of dung across a flat um, open area and then will bury it. They'll either lay an egg in it for re reproduction or adult will eat from the dung beetle. <clears throat> So they set up this experiment with a dung ball in a clear area, put the dung beetle in there right before the eclipse, and the dung beetle started to roll the dung ball. Well, the dung beetles, when the eclipse, when the totality occurred, stopped rolling and submerged in the ground. And they did not emerge until the sun came back out. And what the researcher said was dung beetle rolled fairly direct straight line and they used the sun to navigate and so when that was gone they didn't know what to do they don't have their navigation tool and they just protected themselves in the ground what is a macaque it's a primate yeah um, i don't have a picture speaking of that are you going to speak to or address is there anything about uh what's going to happen to the offspring so this is, I'm glad you asked that question because there are other studies that I read about bats and very few studies find any response from bats. So maybe the smaller bats, it may now also be harder to study, but there was one study that looked at bats specifically and there was no response, no change. So I couldn't find anything except this that changed. I've noticed that a lot of animals shut down during the eclipse because they use the sun as a guide for something. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't remember how much of it was relying on the sun. Right. It, it got a little bit. That happens. I think a lot of heat invertebrates that are moving across, you know, a large area, a landscape, or an ecosystem use the sun for navigation. Oh. Speaking of invertebrates, um, so some insect responses. I already mentioned uh, love calls chirping and shrilling increases in crickets and cicadas. This is something that we will probably be able to hear if we're in a somewhat natural area during the eclipse. Moths, so they set up an exper experiment in this and another study, and they set up a light trap, which Typically, we use at night, biologists use at night, they set up a white sheet, big white shining on it <clears throat> at night, and you get all kinds of insects coming to that sheet. So they set one of those up during the day, and as soon as the sun was blocked, moths were coming to the, to the light traps. Um, the drip net study that I mentioned in multiple streams, where they put a drip net in the stream to see the behavior and abundance of different invertebrate, um, aquatic invertebrates. So the aquatic inver invertebrates that were normally active during the night became active during the eclipse, intuitive, and, this, and it's conversely true those that were typically active at night went to the bottom of the stream and didn't get caught in the drip. So that's um, that response. This was an interesting, I don't have the, the actual study, but it was referenced in another that cockroaches and other insects will swarm. And there was a, there's a story of a pantry being swarmed by cockroaches during an eclipse. So, <laughs> and then also there's some reports of ants freezing, just freezing where they are while it's dark. And then as soon as the sun comes back, they go on their merry way. They need that sun for orientation. So plant responses, there are not very many studies, but given the changes in the environment, the um, humidity, light, uh, you would think there would be some response. So there have been studies on transpiration, rate changes in plants, the transpiration with 
that's when a plant um, is releasing moisture to the air and it's basically um, the temperature and the humidity pull moisture out of the plant depending on, on their relative um, aspects. And so when you have lower temperatures and higher humidity, the pressure on that plant to release its, its um, moisture is, is lower. And so there was a 75-year-old beech tree that they researched and the sap flow, which is the, the li uh, liquids going up the tree, was reduced to less than 90, uh, was reduced by 99%. So basically, plants just freeze. Interestingly, they also did a study of some leaves. They put these leaves in a chamber that looks at their chemical composition. And during the, the um, eclipse, the chlorophyll, which is what makes the leaf green, went down. And the carotenoids in the, in the leaf, which make the, the, give it the yellow and red colors, went up. Like a seasonal, a seasonal change, you know, I think it's turning fall and in winter it's getting darker, so that was interesting. I also was curious about the human responses to an eclipse. Having worked with many Native American tribes, I, I reached out to some of my colleagues in tribes in North America, and, um, and then I double-checked this with some of the studies. Many indigenous people see solar eclipses, especially total solar eclipses, as a time of rebirth, a refreshing. I mean, they have a strong history of oral, oral traditions passing down, so, so they know from former generations that have gone through this. There's a story with that. It's a time for rebirth. But some tribes view it as a bad omen. All of the indigenous people that I have talked to in the studies indicate that it's something that they believe should not be, we should not be exposed to. The sun is battling with the moon, and it's not something that you want to be exposed to, especially if you're a pregnant woman. So I, there's a friend of mine in Austin who has some Navajo uh, doing construction work for her. They're coming down from, from Arizona, and she asked them, so what do you guys want to do for the eclipse? And they told her, we need to be inside. We need to protect ourselves because this is a battle of the sky, a battle of the, the heavenly objects. So it's a time for protection and reflection. Hill country style, however, is different. So we are expecting hundreds of thousands of tourists. There will be eclipse parties and all the parks are already full. I have a friend who was trying to get a reservation in one of the parks in this area and they had a 30-day window that you couldn't make a reservation before 30 days and so at midnight on the day uh, 30 days before she logged on the park was full within a few minutes wow. um, there will be traffic jams and there are predicted spikes in car accidents runs on grocery stores and gas stations so i just advise you to stay and if you're a social media user, document what you observe. Um, well, that was pretty brief, but I'm open to questions. Uh, there were other studies that I found today that I didn't get to into the into the presentation, where um, labs like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology they have for many years used weather radar data to monitor migratory movements of birds. What they do is they take weather satellite data and they filter out the weather, which is above three miles above the Earth. So they look at, look at objects, movements between the ground and about three miles above the ground. And that's either insects or birds, they can't tell which, but that helps them understand bird migratory patterns. So they looked at these during eclipses sure enough, activity just almost ceased during eclipses, during, in that path of totality. I had the idea that it could look like that. I mean, that the sun's light will still come out the sun. I just can't imagine. 
schedule would be totally arbitrary. So what I've been told and I, uh, is that were it not to be cloudy, um, you would see that you would be able to take off your glasses during totality, but not before. And you'll see a ring around the sun, but you will see stars. Around the moon. Around the moon. You're right. You're right. Around the moon. <coughs> but you'll see stars. But if you look to the horizons, and maybe we should do that anyway, cloudy or not, you'll see basically a 360 sunset or sunrise. Has anybody been in a total eclipse here? This is what I'm told by a colleague who went to Nebraska for the 2017 eclipse. She said it was life changing. During that moment, she could look up and see the stars, and around you was just a 360. All of her on the horizon. Yes. So that is it. If, if you're in an area where you can see like uh, all of the horizon or some of the horizon, definitely that's worth observing. And then um, there are websites also that um, show you how to use your phone to document changes in sound. If you're by yourself, for example, or with just a small group and it's in a fairly natural area with no traffic or limited traffic, you can document the changes acoustically and then submit those for scientists to, to compile and, and do some analysis with. Just to follow up on what you're saying, given the rarity and the rarity of this event, sounds like the perfect opportunity to engage citizen scientists uh, to collect data. Are you aware of any specific projects where you can report certain types of data that are collected? I, I do know of some websites. I'd be happy to send them to Crystal and, and share them with y'all. Um, yes, uh, today I ran across, um, it was through the NASA website that they were um, motivating people to collect their own data and submit them. It may not be NASA, but it was it was discussed on the NASA and might be a link, but I will be happy to send those because that, it is very powerful. We use citizen science at the reserve that I manage. Citizens see an organism in a preserve, take a photo, it geolocates your observation of that organism, and it also tells you with using artificial intelligence what it probably is. So in that way, we have hundreds of data points across our preserve of where plants, some rare plants, wildlife, especially insects, have been observed. It's really powerful. So the observations that you show are uh, the animals and, and various plants during the eclipse. Do they were all return to normal very rapidly afterward? What's the, 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 or the observations continue beyond that? All of the studies that I looked at, uh, with little time after the eclipse finished, they returned to normal behavior. Okay. There were um, animals that had no response, like bats that I and um, tarsiers, which is another um, bird species in the tropics. But most of these studies just talked about the animals that did respond. But yes, it was quick, quick after the sun was exposed that they returned to normal behavior. Well, bats typically, they're usually during the day. Yeah, so these, are these bats that were probably uh, documentary responses were um, active during the day. Oh, I see. Yeah. Flying foxes, they tend to migrate regionally during the morning and the afternoon, evening hours, so. Yeah. I wonder if the moon will get sleepy. Because if you know, I, when the sun goes down, that I caught a glimpse of, I think, the, one thing I caught a glimpse of in a study that I was looking at today was that watch how your eyes adjust. Because it's not like a typical sunset or sunrise where our eyes have time to adjust. It'll be so quick. It'll be interesting to see, um, well, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but you might perceive how the moon and pupils dilate. Whether you have trouble focusing on that. I did, but I didn't. I didn't pull them out. Yeah. Pets. Yeah. I saw a lot of studies on livestock, mm -hmm. and mixed. It's a mixed bag. Um, sheep did respond.
respond, did have, like, have normal behaviors, but cows and so many other that did not. Mm -hmm. That partially is because I don't become anxious. Oh, really? Yeah, they were under a chair that night. for the zoo, uh, one of the commentaries was on reptiles. What reptiles reacted to the solar eclipse? What species? Yes. Oh, I'd have to go back and look, and I'm not, I mean, they, they typically use the scientific names, I'm like, I don't know what that is. But they were <laughs> uh, mostly uh, lizards, smaller lizards, and then I know some frogs and toads. <clears throat> studies about fish and fish behavior, but um, basically overall the most common response was animals switching to late evening activity, nighttime activity. <clears throat> and then like, the question was asked, how quickly did they go back to normal daytime activity? I think it was very quick. The environment doesn't go back as quick. The humidity <coughs> stays high. And the temperature stays low for, for quite a while afterwards. There's a map that we find one on the phone. It's called uh, the Globe of Rover, the Globe Program. And there's one specifically about the eclipse and that can record observations. Do you know what institution is uh, on NASA? Oh, that, that's probably the one I ran into then. Yeah. 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 NASA, the Globe. Project. Project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.